So I met a dragon when I was out journeying the other day, and I started having questions. Because it's not uncommon while journeying or doing other spiritual practices to run into a centaur or satyr or all manner of mythical critter. Even saw a unicorn once. So am I crazy? I know some of you are just going to blanketly say the answer is yes. But for those of you who are actually practicing, we really need to dig into the question of how do we work with mythical creatures and what exactly is happening here? Let's talk about that as we walk together down creation's paths. Hello everyone, my name is Charlie. I am a crypto-pagan druid and priest of Bridget. Hello everyone, I am not a cryptozoologist. Do definitely occasionally go on cryptid hunts. And my name is Brian. I think this is something that is important to discuss because not everybody has these kinds of experiences, but I think the more that you're doing meditation work, the more you're doing journeying and stuff, the more likely you are to uh, see things. And we're going to be talking about this on the next couple episodes of the podcast, because I think we need to have our ducks in a row, especially in light of events that have happened. A lot more people are getting interested in the magics, the meditations, the spiritualities, and, you know, how to protect ourselves and do things. Before we get into it, if you haven't already, don't forget to hit that like, subscribe, follow button, whatever it's called on the app you're currently listening to us on. One, yeah, it helps us out, but also we create original Christopagan and Druidic content on this channel five days a week, Monday through Friday, and you don't want to miss anything that we've got coming up because we've got some interesting stuff. What does it mean when you are out journeying or in meditation and encounter a dragon, a griffin, a bagriff, a wampus cat? Is this the sign that you've entered spiritual psychosis? I wonder if maybe even before that, we should talk about cryptids a little, just a touch. I know this isn't exactly about cryptids, but there's this gray area when you start getting into this realm because you have things that are actually physically manifested, things that aren't. It is a wonderful, fantastical area that we're diving into. Yeah, there's a lot here. We can probably come back to it over and over again. I've talked to people who, during meditation, have had experiences of Bigfoot and yeah. or other cryptids and stuff, which definitely fit into this layer of mythological creatures. I, I want to start off by saying I am not taking a stance on whether any of those things are physical, animal, real creatures or not. I, I, I don't know. I like the idea that there are things out there that we haven't found, but I have a big skeptical hat. Like, I want to believe. I'm very scully about this for anybody who remembers the X-Files. I want to believe, but eh, yeah. I... It's more of a wish than a hope for a lot of these things. When we're encountering all of this stuff, I, I do want to first address the issues of spiritual psychosis. Psychosis is when you detach from reality and just kind of run off into a fantasy land. We all need to be very careful about that. Just because when you're under a lot of stress, like many of us are right now, that can lead to a bit of dissociation and detachment and allow us to spin very fancy narratives. I would say that we're in the situation that we're in right now because a large chunk of the population is currently existing in psychosis and have created a common delusion for themselves where they are sharing untruths and various mythologies amongst themselves that they are convinced are 100% true. As I say a lot on this podcast, I don't think it's ever a good thing to take any of our spiritual experiences as 100% true. I don't mean that I don't believe that we have spiritual experiences. I think if God themselves spoke to me, like Moses in the Bible, I'm standing there, burning bush in front of me, other people witnessing the burning bush in front of me, and I'm hearing a voice, I don't think any of us would be able to comprehend or understand what that message is being conveyed. I, I think we are such limited, finite beings that we really wouldn't be able to comprehend and would necessarily misunderstand what's going on. That's why I'm always about take it with a grain of salt. Anything that you're experiencing, really going back to that biblical maxim of test all things and hold to that which is true. 
if it's something that is actually benefiting your life, if it's something that's making your life better, then that's something to continue working with and on. If it's not, just get rid of it. We don't have time to waste, time and energy to waste on things that aren't helpful. So that's thing number one. Thing number two, let's just tackle some of the biggies. Do dragons exist? I don't know. That's a weird question. Did physical dragons exist? My answer since I was a child is yes, there are dinosaurs. I doubt they breathed fire, but there were giant lizard monsters, reptilian creatures running around, tearing things apart. And yeah, a T-Rex didn't have wings and didn't look like a classic fantasy dragon, but I would be as scared of running into a T-Rex as I would be of an actual dragon. Even if you took the, the moment to do the simple thought exercise of, say I'm wandering through the woods and I come around a corner and a giant T-Rex started to raise its head, in the moment of terror that my life is about to end because I'm about to become food for this monster that just rose up and I turn and flee, how good of a look did I really get at it? I mean, at that point, my imagination might add wings. I might think it flew. It didn't matter because the amount of commotion behind me as I was hauling 100 speed away. Uh, plus, most of the dragon myths from around the world are probably because people found dragon bones and didn't know what they were, pieced it together as best they could and went, there were dragons. And yeah, that's probably the case. Okay, so what about people who claim to meet them? Well... Sometimes they're imaginary friends, and we did an entire episode on active imagination. That's not necessarily a bad thing within limits for see our episode on active imagination, where we talk a lot more about that. Also, I, I practice the fairy faith, and uh, fae are shapeshifters. And I think that's true of most spirits. So this could just be the only way that you could understand this. Remember, when we talk about angels, let's just go to angels for a second here, right? When we talk about angels... We have this artistic representation in our head of person, wings, glowing halos, white robes. The word seraphim means fiery serpent. What does that mean? Is this a burning snake? Is this just a description of fire? We actually read biblical descriptions of seraphim. They do seem to just be flames. And this is a poetic way of talking about, like in English, how we say a tongue of fire, that this was serpents of flame. That this could just mean, you know, what fire looks like when it's burning. I, I don't know what the original meaning was when that was written down, but a lot of people who know that seraphim means fiery serpent as part of their practice have started seeing seraphim as dragons made out of fire. A lot of that is because spiritual things do not have a fixed form and generally will appear to us as something comprehensible to us. Thirdly, we have to take into consideration the simple fact that our brains are trying to translate the stimulus, the information it is receiving. And so if your interpretation engine, your translation engine is dragon, you're going to see dragon. Yeah. If it is red brick, it's going to be a red brick. It could be the exact same thing that two different translation engines translate into yeah. what they do. And so that doesn't mean that it is or that it isn't. It's just that is how... The brain translated it because like, it is the form it took. And like with all virtual experiences, I think anytime we try to concretize them, like this to me is why the, there's a prohibition against idolatry, right? When we concretize something and say, this is the way we're wrong. We are just always wrong. This is what this looks like. This is what this is. You're just wrong because there has to be that gap in there for I, I don't know everything. Even just taking into consideration history in relationship to Christian art, so much of it is whitewashed. Yeah. We just know for a simple fact that certain characters in the history could not have been white bearded, the blonde -haired, male figures. <laughs> the blonde haired, blue eyed evangelical Jesus did not exist. Yeah. It didn't. This is a man from the Middle East. He more than likely had black hair, could have had red hair. Red hair was very common in, in Jewish communities back then. A lot of people don't know that. And especially as a descendant of David, the oldest recordings we have about the house of David records that they were redheaded, that they had red hair. So there's a good chance that he may have even had red hair, but we don't know. We don't have a physical description. We have certainly have no photographs or anything, but we allow our imagination to go in and fill in the gap. 
we need to give ourselves this freedom to understand that all of our spiritual experiences are imaginary. They just are. And I don't mean that in the way that they didn't happen. When you are studying, even Maimonides, when he talks about prophecy, explains that prophecy happens in the imagination of the prophet, that God, the angels, whoever brings the message into the imagination of the prophet, and then it takes its form in the imagination of the prophet and the prophet gleams from it what they can. And that's what makes it into writing. That's his explanation of how prophecy works. Ibn al-Arabi says pretty much the same thing in the Islamic culture. And we see this idea within Christianity as well. I think we can even see this in some of the Roman writers who were writing about religion and trying to explain what was happening during the mystery festivals and what was happening with the oracles and whatnot. If you didn't know that we actually have a lot of theological writing from pagan Rome, we have a lot of theological writing from pagan Rome that you can read and see how they work with polytheism <laughs> as a theology, which is fascinating to read. But the imagination is going to be a part of this because you are, I'm not going to say never, but almost never seen something with your physical eyes. This is why journaling is such an important part and why we encourage it heavily in the practice. By journaling, you'll start to create a catalog that you can reference to understand how your translation engine is working. Yeah. What those different images and symbols and mythical creatures mean to you personally. Because the thing is, is it's, it's your personal translation. When we talk about magic and most spiritual things, I use the phrase spiritual technology. And it's not mine. It's an academic term, but it's one I think is very useful to us. It's understanding that we're building an engine. Are there some spirits that may appear in a certain guise more likely than others? Yes, that that's, I, I have found that to be the case, not only in my practice, but in the practice of others. Certain spirits, just like your house spirit, if you want to know how active your house spirits are, if you're seeing something out of the corner of your eye that's like a black cat running around, you pr that, that's probably your house spirit because that seems to be the way most people experience seeing a house spirit is a small, dark shape kind of zoop being past them in, in out of the corners of their eyes. That is a common, I would say almost universal experience. We see it in mythologies around the world and the folklore from around the world and when you talk to people who have a practice dealing with them, that tends to be the way they describe it. But other spirits can and do take on whatever form they want. Now, I don't see in many places a valid reason to distinguish between our active imagination practice and our dealing with external beings. Because whether you're dealing with an unconscious aspect of yourself or filtering through your unconscious understanding of the world and external being, there's that unconscious layer is always a part of the experience that you're having. So I tend to categorize in my own brain all of these experiences as my imaginary friends, even when I have proof of something being external. And what do I mean by proof of something being external? One, we've had spirits move things in our house, like physically interact with things. It's in a way nice and can be also scary when you have physical proof like that. We, we had a demon get into the house once when we were first setting up our wards before we got them all up that literally threw a statue of the Buddha at me that we have. And there's a dent in our floor that you can still see to this day where that hit the ground really hard from quite a distance away. Sometimes there are physical manifestations, if you will, that you're like, oh yeah, something... Something out. You know, when a statue of the Buddha flies across the room at you, yeah, I'm not looking for a physical explanation for what happened because unless there was a hidden catapult that I couldn't see on that shelf across the room, yeah. nothing would make it go up, you know? And you, you need some kind of energy being added into a system to make it go up into the air. So that happens sometimes. Sometimes when we're dealing with external spirits, we will get information we could not have known otherwise. That to me is even sketchy because... I think we all kind of have a certain level of psychic ability to us. And I think we are all connected in the Noah sphere in this kind of mass consciousness that does exist on earth. So even there, I have a hard time understanding whether or not it was a, if you will, like a psychic vibe that gave us that information or an external spirit giving us that information. But again, I think that's a 
distinction without a difference in a lot of ways. That's verifiable information, by the way. It's not, they told you some radically crazy thing that you just know is true. No, like when my sister was in a car accident many, many, many years ago, my mother and I both woke up in our bed when it happened. My mother heard her calling her name and I just saw my sister's face and knew something was wrong. That is an external knowledge. My mother's was very psychic related. Mine was actually one of my guides that was running around in my dream was like, oh, something's wrong and woke me up. Like, you need to get up now, right? Were we both having a psychic experience? Distinction without a difference, right? That's external information. We both woke up basically at the time she had her car wreck and it wasn't for another hour that we got a phone call letting us know that she was in the hospital. That's external knowledge. That's verifiable external knowledge. And that's really important because I think a lot of people in these experiences receive knowledge that is unverifiable and they hold it like gospel truth. That's why unverifiable personal gnosis has such a bad reputation. And we need to hold any of this very lightly. If you cannot validate that information, it, it, it's apocryphal. It's a maybe. Learning to have that humility is really important. But I think it can be valid and very helpful for us to seek out experiences with these mythological creatures. One of my favorite books is uh, Nine Ways to Charm a Dryad by Penny Billington. I love the book. I love the exercises that are in the book. Do I believe that trees have spirits? Yes, I'm an animist. I believe there's a spirit in everything. Do I believe that dryads are real? Like the way they're portrayed in Greek mythology? Probably not, but I'm not a Hellenic practitioner. If you are, you may have very different views about the reality of dryads. I, I do believe in tree spirits that, because I, I believe everything has a spirit, but okay. So we're going to try to reach out to the dryad in the trees around us. To me, there's nothing wrong with suspending my disbelief in whether or not dryads are real in trying these practices. And I found them very enriching. I found them very meaningful for me. They helped me connect to the where I live in a way that's very hard for me to do because I am not a big fan of the people in the region that I live in. And I have kind of a rough relationship with this area because of traumas that have happened to me here. So I got a lot out of it. Was I dealing with the actual spirit of the trees or funking in my imagination? I would personally, I would say six of one, half a dozen of the other. I kind of feel like I have an instinct for when I'm dealing with an external spirit or when I'm dealing with something to myself. I think some of the meditations were very active imagination experiences that were happening completely inside of me. I do know that the tree said that it was going to give me a gift. And I went out the next day and there was a new branch growing out of the tree in a place that I would not have expected. So it's a really weird spot, but that, that, to yeah. me, that, 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 but it is, it, that becomes something that is external, external verification. verification, having that humility to live in this wonderful cloud of unknowing, right? This, I don't know, but it's having a valid and useful experience on my life. It's helping me to have more calm, more peace. It's helping me to feel more comfortable where I'm li living. All of those are valid and perfectly good reasons to continue to practice, right? Whether or not I had that external experience or not. And also just not taking it seriously that I'm literally ch chatting to a tree. Like I might say that because I like to speak with metaphorical language, but I understand when a metaphor is a metaphor and other people might not. So I have to be very careful when I'm talking to others that, yeah, I was talking to the tree the other day. Well, maybe, you know, but when you're telling a story, you don't know if we stop, break the flow of the story for the, for that piece. I have had experiences with many mythological beings and I have sought them out. I have sat back and went, you know, it'd be really interesting to have a conversation with a phoenix, with the dragon, with the unicorn, with a fill in the blank and have structured rituals and meditations to have interactions. Did I actually see a unicorn? I, I, I don't believe that there are physical unicorn, bi like biological unicorns running around in the world. I don't believe that. Is there a class of spirit that is a unicorn? Maybe, but probably not. But maybe this speaks a lot to that humility occupying the space that it's supposed to occupy. Yeah. If it's beneficial 
to the practitioner, if it is helping them, then it's good and should be continued. When interacting with others, part of that living and right relationship is understanding when you're communicating with them, they're going to have language and translation issues and you have to help them. So sometimes you may not share because it is improper humility to share with somebody who's going to hear you talking to a tree and just think you're crazy. And sometimes it's okay to share with them with that because they understand that you're not just talking to a tree, that is, you're actually working through stuff and it is part of the, the mental healing process and building yourself up. Now, if you're sharing it with them for ego reasons, that would also be, that wouldn't be humility. Yeah. Like, I've gone seeking dragons before and I've run into them in the wilds before. Probably they were just certain spirits in certain areas that my, because I was already seeking that, my brain instantly translated as dragon. But if I were to go out and brag about that, that is not living in the right relationship. That is not living in good humility because now I'm doing it for ego reasons. That's also the path that leads to the spiritual psychosis and stuff. But the experience was still a good experience. It was okay that I went out hunting about things. I learned a lot about myself from that. That's a lot of what the work is about. When I, when I say like I sought out certain experiences, every time I feel like I'm going through a change, sometimes really big, especially really big changes like have happened over the last couple of years, I want to consult the spirit of a phoenix. Phoenixes are like the ultimate symbol of rebirth. Like they die, burn to ashes and come back in this glorious plume of flame. There is no greater symbol of rebirth than a phoenix in my eyes. Do I believe that there are phoenixes? I, I have, I, I think phoenixes and seraphims are possibly cognate words. I think they might be the same class of, of spirit. I think that they're, it could also be the ashim that are described as fiery. Like ashim literally means the fiery ones. And they are spirits of the kingdom of Malk of the lower Sephira. So it could be a way of interpreting an experience with them. They could be an Ifrit for all I know, and they could be Jinn because I have, I have questions about Jinn. I have encountered things that the only way I can understand what they were is to use the terminology of the Jinn. I, I don't know, right? But did those experiences that I sought out, those rituals, those meditations, help me through those periods of rebirth? Yes. And that to me, I'm very results oriented. Now I'm not a Machiavellian in that the ends justify the means kind of a person. Like yeah, you, you don't hurt other people. You do not hurt yourself. You do not cause harm. I am very, the ends do not justify the means. The asterisk on that is I don't care about the means sometimes. Like it does me no harm if I'm talking to a part of myself that's going to give me the wisdom and strength to get through a situation. Or if I'm talking to an external being that's going to give me the wisdom and the strength to get through a certain situation. That is a, again, a distinction without a difference. As long as I get that wisdom and strength, it did what it needed to do. I think a way to maybe help clarify that is going back to, you will know them by their fruits. Yeah. And so for both of us, we like to look at what are the fruits of whatever it is, the encounter in this particular yeah. instance. What is the fruits of the encounter? Was it good fruit or bad fruit? <laughs> I think it can be very helpful, especially for people who are new to the craft. There are a lot of people that are new to the craft right now. I'll let you know right now, the other crowd are not cute little Barbie dolls with wings that are flying around. Read the original Peter Pan. Most of the other crowd, while not visually like Tinkerbell, are much more like Tinkerbell than the other depictions of the other crowd. And I don't mean the Disney movie. I am not talking about the Disney movie. I'm talking about the original book where she's pulling out people's hair and trying to get people killed. Like Tinker, the original Tinkerbell is a trickster of the highest order. That's what you're going to be dealing with, uh, with a lot of the other crowd. If that is an image that means something to you, even if you're just doing an active imagination practice with that image, it will give you some help and some peace and help you to move along and figure out where you need to go next. If you really love the idea of gnomes in your garden, it does you no harm to pretend or believe that there are gnomes in your garden. The problem is when you cross that line and get to be one of those people who's like, oh, I don't believe, I know, I know there are gnomes in my garden. 
I would guess that there are gnomes in my garden. If gnomes are a class of spirit that exists, I do believe that there are various land spirits. Whether any of them are technically gnomes or not, I don't know. But yeah, I've seen little things running around under the rose bushes and around some of the plants that we have. And I jokingly go, huh, the gnomes are out and just go on with my business, right? Do I know that there are gnomes? In no, I don't know that there are gnomes in my garden. For all I know, <laughs> I saw some mice or a cat running around under there. They moved around really quickly because there are a lot of wild cats around here. On a funny side note, I have sicked the gnomes on some of the wild cats, which is how I know there's some kind of spirit running around there because oh, yeah. I had the physical interaction because a wild cat was moving into the yard and I sicked the gnome on it and I watched the cat literally panic and respond as if it was being physically attacked by something, even though I couldn't see anything physically on it and it ran off. It was very entertaining. But once I again... I said, no, I don't know. It was, it's something. Right. I interacted with it. I, I, it was all good. I like, and I'm not going to go to either. Extremes tend to be not a good place. All about that middle way. Yeah. It's all about that middle way. I like the word gnome. I like saying the word gnome. I think gnomes are cute in artwork. I think of a lot of Brian Froud's artwork with gnomes and fairies and whatnot. And it brings me joy. Is that what they are? I don't think we will ever have a scientific taxonomy of spirit. I just don't think that that's the thing that's going to happen because, again, our minds don't comprehend what we're experiencing all that well. And there will always be this layer of imagination between us and what we're seeing. That's true in our just daily life in general. If you don't actually know how cognition works, like that your brain is on a slight delay and that is building this hologram inside your mind. Like you're not seeing what you think you're seeing because your eyes are grabbing little bits of detail and darting around and building little bits of detail and keeping a mental model inside of your brain of what's going on around you. We have less contact with the outside world than we think we do other than physical touch and what whatnot. But we have less contact with the outside world than we think we do. Most of this is an, imag an imaginal experience in our own heads. Just the idea that you see separate things those separate things aren't really real. There's so many atoms between you and those other things. It is one continuous soup that just has some bits moving around in. It's much more like looking into a stained slide with a bunch of protozoa moving around in it than it is anything else. But our eyes don't see the air unless it's particularly foggy or smoggy or something. It's like there's nothing between us and the other things when there's billions, if not trillions of particles between us and them. All of our, especially visual experiences, are illusions, but they're informed illusions. And that's what we need to bring to our spirituality as well, is that as much as we can with the touching grass and understanding that there is a real physical world out there, the better. But yeah, if you want to, if you have a particular draw to a certain thing, and look, I, I'm going to say extend mythological out even further, if you have a connection with Tolkien's elves or the Einar or his dwarves or anything else. Have an active imagination experience with them. No, you're not going to contact the spirit of the hobbits, but you can have a valid and real active imagination experience with the Valar, with the Maiar. Once again, because it is your personal translation engine, it could at least open you up so that a spirit that could fill that role could then interact with you because then your your brain's like, okay, I ha I can bridge this gap. Yeah. I understand enough of this other language now. And it, that might be what that individual practitioner needs. Yeah. And it's okay. But don't take any yeah, of it too don't seriously. Don't take it too seriously, though. Yeah. Take what's good. Take what's beneficial. But don't take any of it too seriously. There be dragons there quite, I would say literally, because that's where you get off into danger. It's where you can go mm -hmm. off the map. We don't want to do that. All right. I hope you found this helpful. I hope that this really did help you out. I love playing around with both active imagination and journeying. And I think active imagination can be very, very helpful and handy. Once you start developing your active imagination practice and see that as a valid part of your magic, because it is internal alchemy. If you just need to live in a ha happy place. There have been times where I have quite literally had an active imagination space where I just sat in 10 forward on the start of USS Enterprise in CC 1701D and watched the stars go by and had a conversation with Guinan in my head. 
Did I have a conversation with Guinan? No, I did not have a conversation with Guinan, but I was able to represent this part of me. Whatever you see as your mythology, I want to extend this out. That's basically as we're ready this. I want to extend this out. This isn't just like there are fairy tales and myths about it. Anything that is valid in your mythos that can help bring you some sense of calm, peace, empowerment, do, it, do an act of imagination with it and let it bring up in you something from your unconscious that will help you out because it will help you out a lot. Okay. I hope that this was helpful. I really do. If you've ever dealt with a mythological creature and feel comfortable talking about it in the comments, go ahead and leave us one. If you're listening to us on Spotify or YouTube, you can leave a comment right there. If you're listening to us anywhere else, even if it says you leave a comment there, they, they don't tell us. You can leave one there because engagement is magic and then head over to creationspaths.com and click on chat and you can leave a comment there and we will see it and be able to respond to you. While you're there, if you have any money, you can pass our way. You can think about joining a membership. You can also support us on Patreon and Kofi. I am CE Dorset on both. And that money really does go a long way to help us keep the lights on, keep a roof over our heads and food on our table. Thank you so much to everybody who already does that. And if you don't have any money, don't worry about it. You can always help us out by sh sharing the podcast with other people and helping them to know that we're out here doing this work. Because the more we help the community grow, the more people we can help. And while, yeah, it would be, it's nice to be able to pay the bills, we're really doing this to help people. And hopefully we are doing a decent job at that. Oh, great and mighty muse, genius of our souls that grants us to creativity, imagination, gives us the ability to tell stories and to weave mayhem, amazing tales. Help us as we come to understand the power of our imagination, both to work within, but how it helps us to interpret the world outside of us so that we may live in strength, honor, and vitality for the rest of our days. Amen. Amen. Hey,